It was the era of hippies, yippies, and peace signs, sit-ins, lovin's, civil rights, and anti-war protests. Easy Rider, Archie Bunker, and LSD, The Cold War, Long Hair, Woodstock, Bell Bottoms, and Rizla. For those of us who are old enough to understand the major events of the time, it was like riding a giant roller coaster, exhilarating one moment and terrifying the next. Although Americans had to do nothing more than look up at the moon and see great things that we were capable of, neither did we have to look very far to see the horrifying things we could stop. The assassinations of Robert F. Kennedy, Medgar Evers, and Martin Luther King Jr. were direct assaults on everything good America stood for. Violent, bloody riots in Detroit, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., and Chicago left people and property badly damaged, often beyond repair. Even more, the tragic shootings of four Kent State University students by the Ohio National Guard in 1970 left many wondering what kind of America would do such a thing and who might be next. On our streets, on our television screens, and at our family dinner tables, America was at war with itself, and much of the worst of it was reserved for the issue of Vietnam. What a powerful opening. That uh, comes from Downstairs at the White House, a book by Don Stenson, who I am uh, honored to have on the show here. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm honored to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Well, I grew up during the 60s. Uh, the 60s were a tumultuous period, to say the least. And for those of your viewers who are my age, and I'm going to be 67, which is hard to believe, uh, that it was something that it was difficult to wrap your mind around. Uh, I mean, I remember as a small child, I was eight when President Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated in 1968, I was 13, uh, we had a family friend, uh, in fact, there's a book that's just been written about him uh, named Bill Baggs, who was the editor of the Miami News, uh, which is where I grew up in Miami. Uh, he, uh, was both, he was close to both JFK and RFK. So, you know, I, I was sort of uh, given some up-close impressions of national politicians and what was going on. Coming, my, my father uh, was in the newspaper business, as I was later. And uh, as a result of that, um, in coming from a family that was very attuned to what was happening at any given moment, uh, th there were a lot of shocks to the system. And, and so as we went through, we went through a period of political assassination that was horrific. We also went through enormous social change, um, and there were there were arguments that occurred at dinner tables on a consistent basis that had everything to do, and anything to do, with the length of your hair, of a, a boy's hair, uh, to the Vietnam War, to uh, women's liberation, to birth control, to you name it. It was all just boiling over. And it was, a, it was a fascinating time. So I got interested in politics. And um, I applied to college at the end of my junior year, basically because I was looking for a place that had more girls. I was going to an all-boys school. And um, I somehow managed to get in, I'm sure it was a clerical error, to American University, the School of Public Affairs in Washington. And uh, so off I went to Washington, D.C., and um, I really wanted to work on Capitol Hill. I thought the coolest thing, I mean, at 17, the coolest thing in the world were these guys and girls who had internships on Capitol Hill. Um, and they kind of like, guys would come to class with ties on and things like that. I just thought that was... It was a really stature. Cool. Yeah. Absolutely, you know? And so I tried to do that, and, and I relate a number of stories in the book of how many times I was turned down. Um, it, it got to be into the, the, the double digits. And the, it, but some people were very nice. Some of them weren't at all, as I tried to figure out a way to, to get something on Capitol Hill. 
one day, and this is you know what, how life works, uh, I am talking to a guy who lived on my floor in the dormitory, and he said that he had a job in a place called the Old Executive Office Building, and that he was going to give it up, and he knew I was looking for something, and this actually paid. It was a real job, not an internship. It was a real job. And it amounted to being a messenger, being a clerk, and those kinds of things. So I said, sure, why not? And I went down and I interviewed. And I went into this building. I had no idea what it was. None. And only that it was extraordinarily uh, ornate, huge, uh, and lots of people were walking around that looked important. Well, I got hired. Um, and I became a messenger for a group called the Council on International Economic Policy that I'm not so sure even exists anymore, uh, that reported to an assistant to the president. And I had a great time. It was, it was part-time during the school year and full-time during the summer, and it worked out just great. And I was meeting all sorts of very interesting people. One of my friends was the daughter of Justice Harry Blackman. Uh, she was working there as a secretary at the, uh, on a part-time basis. Um, I got to meet uh, John Connolly. I got to meet a lot of figures who were big historical figures at the time, just because I'd be walking down the same hall. And I remember in one conversation one day talking to uh, one of the secretaries, as they were called in those days, uh, I was standing talking to her exactly at the place where the where Jap Japanese diplomats had come over on December 7th, 1941 to talk to the secretary, our secretary of state uh, about the fact that uh, the Japanese were still hoping for peace at the same time they were bombing Pearl Harbor. So it was that kind of, pl kind of place. And I, I didn't really understand all of it at the time. The only thing I did know that I thought was really odd was that I could look out one of the windows and I could see the White House. And uh, that just it didn't seem to make any sense to me why a building would be that, be that close. So I did that for, uh, for, I don't know, eight, nine, ten months, something like that. One day, uh, I met somebody uh, who worked for Vice President Agnew. And I literally, you know how you say you run into people? Okay, I literally did that. Literally. I don't know what you were like when you were 17, but since you're an athlete and everything, I used to walk way too fast everywhere. And this one fellow uh, was uh, filling up a coffee pot at a, a, a bubbler or a water Park, fountain. Percolator. Yes. Yeah. And... Uh, I literally knocked him over. He turned out to be one of Agnew's speechwriters. Uh, and we got to be friends, and one thing led to another, and I ended up working for Agnew for a period of time. Uh, I was there. I, I wrote letters. Uh, I drafted letters that went to uh, children's groups. I mean, there was nothing heavy in all of this. But I was the recipient, you know, because I was the youngest. By then, I think I was 18. In fact, one of the funny things somebody brought up when I was giving a speech at the, I, I, I don't know, a few years ago, we were at the Truman Library and gave a speech. Somebody said, you had a secure, uh, top secret security clearance before you could vote. And I did. I mean, there, there are things you could get away in the, with in those days that you couldn't do now anymore. Really, yeah, by the history of events, there's a lot more security and a lot more... Uh... Absolutely. In fact, the things in my book, I could have, you couldn't get away. Uh, and the so I, I, I went to work for Agnew I, and, and because I was the youngest I got the weird stuff dumped on me and you know when I found out in, in life is that even those things can be wonderful opportunities because at one time there was a grocery bag that came in I mean dealing with the public is an interesting experience there was uh, this grocery bag came in, and I write about it in the book, and it was filled with terrible, all sorts of terrible stuff. We'll leave it at that. And 
it was then my job seeing this stuff to take it to the Secret Service. So I went down to the, to the Vice Presidential Protective Division to give this to them. I, of course, am thinking this is the biggest deal ever. To them, it was Tuesday. You know, it, it, did, it, it was just another day of crazy stuff. But while I was there, one of the agents who I had come to know said to me, there was a, there was a guy standing over uh, by one of the tables talking to some people. He said, do you know who that is? I said, nope, just some guy, I guess. And he said, uh, that's Clint Hill. And all of a sudden it struck me who he was. Clint Hill was the Secret Service agent who threw himself on the back of President Kennedy's limousine and threw himself on top of the President and the First Lady in Dallas. Uh, and I had an opportunity to meet him at that time, which was one of the great honors of my life. Uh, he, truly an American hero. He's still alive. He writes books. And I encourage people in your audience to read them. Absolutely fascinating stuff. What was, it, what was uh, he like? You know, just very normal. Just, uh, you know, I mean, I think, I think most, the Secret Service agents that I got to know and uh, were, um, there weren't, in those days, there were not people who at least seemed to me that thought they were important because they were bodyguards to somebody important. They were just nice guys. And they were nice to me, uh, particularly when we played poker and I'd lose and they'd take my money. They, they liked me a lot. So anyway, I worked for Agnew. Uh, Agnew resigned in October of 1973. I was in, a, uh, in the conference room when we had a uh, general uh, who was the military aide to the vice president who came marching into the conference room where we were all assembled. It was a relatively small staff and uh, told us that our leader had just resigned his high office, turned in a military about face and walked right back out the door, just leaving us standing there. Uh, it was, a, I, I, I describe it in the book about what it felt like in all of that. But that was just part of the added turmoil that was now carrying from the 60s into the 70s. Um, it, that's just something that had not been experienced in the lifetimes of uh, people at that time, that you would have someone that was second in command all of a sudden resign, and particularly resign uh, for reasons that uh, were criminal. Uh, so after that, um, I ended up uh, going, I was being, I, they all said that we, we were government employees, and so that we would we'd be found jobs. It's the first thing I found in my life about being toxic. I'd go somewhere for an interview, and again, these were for mostly part-time job. And they'd say, you work for Agnew, right? And I'd say, yes, I, I did. And they'd say, we don't have any. It's sort of guilty by association? Is yeah, that where this came of, from? You know, and, um, and, I, and I have to say, I got to know him, uh, and there have been lots of different things said about him over the years. Uh, Rachel Maddow is, uh, you know, has, uh, did a podcast and wrote a book about all of that. I think there's something different about when you know some of those people. Uh, to me, he was a very nice man. He actually knew my name. He knew where I went to school. He asked me how my grades were. Um, he'd ask about my parents. Uh, and you have a kind of a different feeling for that. So I ended up uh, bouncing around in the, in the government and ended up back in the White House. Uh, through a friend's help uh, in the East Wing, uh, which is normally where the First Lady's offices are. They were at that time. And uh, so I started another adventure there. It, it's funny, you actually mentioned um, being 17, and your book is actually very relatable to, I, I related pretty well to you at, at me being 17, 18 years old as a um, you know, trying to discover the, uh, the world, trying to uh, meet girls and bring them to these. Uh, you were on kind of a different scale, though, because you were trying to bring them. You were trying to bring them to uh, uh, a ball or whatever was going on at the time. Yeah. And 
running into some hilarious, I'm not going to give anything away, but running into some uh, very interesting hurdles that <laughs> not, you know, um, I guess just not knowing enough about the world or just these things you have to learn over right. time and being a 17-year-old kid. But you know what was funny is played out in my life. I've been, I'm a stumbler. I just stumble into things. Um, and I don't know why <laughs> that is. I stumbled into that job. I was in the middle of 9-11 in Washington. Um, I, there, any number, I walked out of the uh, World Trade Center in New York in 93, about 30 minutes uh, before it was bombed. Um, and I've had these experiences throughout my life. I'm sort of dangerous possibly to be around, but it's been interesting um, to say the case. And one of the funny stories in there has to do with Bob Hope and Charlton Heston. And, um, and, and I, if, if, if any of you are, uh, if your viewers are fans of those guys, if you remember them from the old days, uh, they were my wingmen one night and thought it was hysterical. Almost 20 years later, in a different setting in Palm Springs, California, I run into Bob Hope and he, we had a conversation about what had gone on in 1973 and the presidential inauguration and all of that. And I was telling him the story about how nice he and Heston had been to my date and all of this. And he looks at me and he goes, you're the guy? And I said, well, yes, I am. He said, we've been laughing about you for the last 20 years. <laughs> so you have to read this story. I right. And you, uh, there was a story about uh, Sinatra, too. You, you sort of stumbled into Sinatra yeah, as well. I, I poured ice water on a sock. Um, and, you know, um, I, I, he was actually very nice about it, <laughs> which was a relief. Um, but, you know, it's, it's one of those kind of things that I've, uh, that I've talked to my own children about, to a lot of young people. It's, you know, give something a try. Step out on something. Step out of your, com your comfort zone and give something a try. I, I don't think I had a comfort zone. So, there, you know, there was nothing really to get over. Uh, but you just never know what will happen. And so I ended up, you know, meeting lots of people, talking to lots of people, and having a lot of interesting experiences as, as a result. Uh, but you were learning it at a different level and learning some of these people on, uh, on a personal level than, say, maybe your friends or your family. Was there a different feeling that you had um, sort of learning it the way you did versus maybe you, you came home and had dinner with your family or something like that? Uh, yeah. There is a difference when you get to you get to know people. Uh, I never knew President Nixon. We had a couple. Of, we had a couple of conversations, which I was very fortunate to have. He was a fascinating individual. Mrs. Nixon, I got to know. Uh, a number of characters who were connected to Watergate, but not in criminal ways. I got to know based on the time that I. I got there. I got there at a point where um, of only a, maybe 60, 90 days after I started there, uh, the Watergate hearings began. Uh, and so I didn't, I didn't know those folks. But, you know, you would hear conversations about someone who was in the public eye, who was going to jail, and somebody talking about, you know, their wife and uh, children and that kind of an impact that was going on. So it, it did have a different feel for it. Um, it. It was also, looking back on it, different than I probably would have expected. Um, the people, there was a depression that set over the place that would rise and fall based on what news coverage was in any given day. Now, I was so insignificant <laughs> that most everything that I learned, I learned from the Washington Post, the radio, and television, even though some of the events that were going on were happening 20 feet away from where I was working. Uh, I wasn't exactly called in, you know, to, for people to get my opinion on, on things. But uh, when I got the job inside the White House, uh, they gave me way too much uh, latitude in where I could go. 
than they should have ever given to a 17-year-old, a 18-year-old. Uh, that, that by then I was you know, much older. Um, and so uh, I ran into President Ford as he was on the way to the Oval Office when Nixon uh, was going to tell him he was going to resign. Uh, and, and actually got slammed up against a wall in a stairwell by um, Secret Service agents who I knew. But, they, they, you know, but they had a job. To, they they had a job to do. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I used to try to hang out as much as I could while all of those things were going on in the area right outside the Roosevelt Room, um, which is a kind of angular uh, direction across from the Oval Office. And I would hang out there and uh, try to watch what was going on. The other thing that I did, because again, I was young, was I'd, I'd try to seal the deal on dates. I was dating way above my weight class. Okay? <laughs> I was trying to, and so my deal would be, you know, well, we'll go to a movie, we'll, we'll go to dinner, whatever the case may be, and I'll take you to see the Oval Office. Um, and, you know, even that didn't work. <laughs> Many times, once in a while it did, but not very often. <laughs> You know, and you said that, um, I remember you, you sort of cited that you working for the Nixon administration wasn't exactly popular amongst college kids. Which, no. <laughs> and you really tried to keep that, you know, like, I tried to keep that on the, on the down low for, for the most part. You know, I, I did uh, for a while. And then I kind of got, uh, I got fed up with the things that I was hearing. I think, you know, again, the book's not political. But I think there are some things that you can look at that were major accomplishments uh, of the Nixon administration that people ignored. And they focused on what was going on in Watergate, but forgot that he was bringing an end to the Vietnam War. I mean, a lot of controversy in how all of that happened. But, you know, he, he, he started the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. He, in many ways, he was the last of the New Deal presidents. Uh, and that that saw a role of, for government that could actually help people. Now, they did a lot of other, you know, very bad things, but uh, eventually I just kind of got cocky about it, and I would talk about it in class and that kind of thing and, and be a real jerk. It, and <laughs> yeah, Well, you wanted to be the, you were trying to be the devil's advocate, I assume. Well, that's a nice way to put it. Okay. <laughs> Now, you, as you're kind of wandering, I, I'm imagining sort of uh, your innocence kind of got you by, you know, sort of this, uh, this fly on the wall, as, as you were saying, you just were kind of wandering around, but your sort of innocence, you weren't, um, you know, a top political figure, or you weren't, oh, then I saw you as this innocent young man walking around, you're like, yeah, sure. You know, uh, somebody in the 90s, and listening to me, tell one of these stories over probably way too much to drink, said, oh, I know who you're like. You're like the aide, the young man who is the aide in, to the president in the West Wing, the TV series at that time. And I said, well, no. I would have been the lint on his jacket. I mean, I, I, was, I was, again, very insignificant. But I just got to be at the right place at the right time for a while. And, and I was naive about it, a whole lot of stuff. So uh, it was, uh, in, in someone put it, it was kind of like Dennis the Menace, if you remember or ever heard of that character. Dennis the Menace meets Richard Nixon. It was, it was that guy. A quote from Agnew, he said, I am not asking for, the, for government censorship or any kind of censorship. Agnew said, I am asking whether a kind of censorship already exists when the news that 40 million Americans receive each night is determined by a handful of men responsible only to their corporate employers and filtered through a handful of commentators who admit their own set of biases. Right. To say that he, he made those comments in a speech in Des Moines, Iowa, to say that that was controversial would be a gross understatement. In those days, there were three networks. That, that was it, and PBS. 
Uh, and so there was ABC, NBC, and CBS. And uh, so none of what we have today was even dreamt of. This is long before cable. It was like Walter Cronkite, and Walter Cronkite was right, and you yeah, didn't you really know, question that. Yes, Cronkite, you know, was he, he was a father figure in many ways. People believed him. He was referred to as the most trusted man in America, and I and I think with very good reason. Um, what the point that Agnew was trying to make was that that there were agendas that these corporate that corporations had. Uh, that influenced the news. And in his particular case, those tended to be liberal agendas as opposed to conservative ones. Uh, one of the things that had gone on in the background with this is that uh, there w had been discussion, or rumors at least, that uh, Nixon didn't want Agnew to run with him again in 72. It's hard to believe it, 50 years ago. And, but what they were going to do was to give him the job as a head of a conservative network, uh, which m might have become Fox at some point. But, it, but then again, I have to say that the difference between so-called liberals and conservatives in those days, it, 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 it was nothing like it was now. I mean, there was a lot more commonality, enormous amounts of more commonality uh, then there were differences about kind, those kinds of things. But in any event, uh, he, uh, so he tried to press that agenda. Now, later in later years, I worked for a, an $8 billion media company and watched how uh, opinions uh, for news content, editorial content, were not sent down the line by uh, by corporate uh, bosses. So uh, there's an argument that he was quite off about that. But it was a good hook point to try to, as a politician, to try to uh, help Nixon deal with what was bad press a lot of the time. Was this the early form of saying fake news? <laughs> it wasn't fake. It was just the approach that was taken to different stories. Um, in those days, people had, uh, if you had gotten on television or in, or in an interview in a newspaper and you had lied and, and the network would have, or the newspaper uh, would have carried that and not made a statement about it to correct it, that would have been an unpardonable sin. We, we didn't have fake news. News is, and I, I was never a news guy. I was actually on the advertising side. Um, nonetheless, um, the, the news content was straight. It was supposed to be straight. It was supposed to be corrected. It went through the hands of multiple editors to be, and it still is today, except with certain elements of media who don't uh, use utilize those standards uh, but no it, you would have been shut off well what i was get i guess what i was getting at was his frustration with what he um what yeah. he saw as he called it slanted yeah is is uh, the criticism that the nixon administration was saying so that's kind of where i was going with right. that half joking <laughs> i said that was his um 1970s, much more articulated version of saying <laughs> fake news is what I was getting at. I didn't clearly state my uh, my position there. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and it's so. I'm kind of seeing, as I look back then, as I as I had read your book and read some of the history and looked at some of the history of the the 70s, I'm sort of interested in um, the evolution of, I guess this w was the start of the evolution of the, the mistrust in government that we see today. Um, the questioning, I guess you will, of, right. of the mistrust of government. That, that really started in the Johnson administration. There was uh, the Vietnam War, yeah, would you say? The credibility gap. Uh, and that 
there were a number of things that got that started. Uh, there were uh, erroneous reports put out by the government on the number of Americans that were killed in Vietnam and the number of Vietnamese or Viet Cong that we had killed uh, to make everything look better. It, it, it was a very odd situation uh, because it, it, you, you'll, you may recall it from the book, is, is that there were lives, absolute, complete, utter lives that were told to the American people about things that escalated the Vietnam War. Um, and one of them had to do with uh, a boat called the USS Maddox uh, that misread, uh, that, mis that in, the, in truth misread what they thought were aggressive actions by the Viet Cong uh, when it was actually, it's a, it's a long story, but, but people were finding out that the government was lying in order to try to uh, justify elements of the war uh, at the same time that people were coming back uh, in body bags. And I, I, I think, uh, I think, your, your viewers uh, who are younger, don't remember that time, might, might actually find that interesting uh, be, because it, it really started a different kind of conversation with the government, the kind of demonstrations that we had not seen before, the chance of, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Um, and a lot of that came from Johnson's uh, refusal to lose a war. We had never lost. I mean, Korea kind of became a, a draw, uh, the Korean War, but we hadn't lost. And he believed that, that the American people, uh, you know, at that time, the mainstream were World War II veterans, uh, would not have taken that well at all. Uh, you know, looking back on it, it was a series of absolute disasters. Uh, and we owe a lot to the guys who were veterans. Uh, I missed the draft by uh, about a year. Uh, and we owe a lot to the guys who actually went over there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it was 58,000? Yeah. Yeah. And, that, right. and, you know, when I grew up, as I was reading this, as these are the thoughts that I'm having is I was, as I grew up, I was seeing the, um, you know, the Afghanistan Iraq war and I was seeing some sort of the, the same things. I don't know if you can in any way um, relate this as history sort of repeats itself. Um, people felt that we shouldn't have been neither one of these places, Iraq or uh, Vietnam. There were certainly those feelings uh, in the case of Vietnam, uh, that kept growing to a crescendo. Now, there's interest. There's an interesting element to that. It's not in my book, but you can find it in other things. Uh, that said that that the demonstrations claimed that the demonstrations never had any impact on U.S. military policy. Well, I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, but <clears throat> it 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 ripped things apart. Uh, there, there was something that, you know, my generation certainly was not used to, uh, and that was if you were sitting in high school, uh, a teacher or the principal would come to the door uh, and, of the classroom and call out a certain student who would go out to meet his or her parents in the hallway to be told that their brother, uh, you know, had been reported either missing in action or, or had died. I mean, it, it was a... It was a great shock to the system. So jumping back in uh, a little bit to your time to kind of shift gears a little bit. Um, tell me about, so at the at the time you were in, there was, um, at the time you got into the White House, there was the, there was the water, the Watergate was a kind of a big deal. It was a very big deal. Yeah. Um, the pulse from the outside was that everything was crumbling. What was... Thing, what were things like on the inside? Were they, um, you know, was it immediate from from the 
just after the break-ins when the story started coming out or did it kind of ramp up and down so how, how were things and in- well i wasn't there when the break-in occurred i wasn't there until uh february of 73 uh and then as i mentioned a few months it was several months later may when the uh, watergate hearing started uh with a a great North Carolinian, uh, Sam Earp, who led them. Uh, I'll put it to you this way, and I and I talk about this in a number of different things in the book, but to give you a feel for what it was like in the earlier part, and you know, like March, April of 1974, Nixon, of course, resigned in August, is that the uh, Xerox machine, which were not all that great in those days, <laughs> uh, were seemingly running 24 hours a day, uh, spitting out copies of people's resumes uh, because they, they wanted to get off the ship. Now, those were the political people. The, they were the political appointees. I mean, there's two different groups there. There are political appointees, and then there are government employees. The government employees stay uh, over time. And... Uh, <laughs> One of the, yeah, the White House, at least at that time, and in my experience, it was no different than any other office I ever worked in after. Same stuff, gossip, different kinds of things, all all of that. I worked with a group of guys in actually in the basement of the East Wing. So when I talk about downstairs at the White House, it's just downstairs, uh, really downstairs. And uh, I worked with a number of guys who were butlers. Uh, I got to know uh, Eugene Allen and made a movie uh, about him called The Butler. Oprah Winfrey had something to do with it years ago. He was wonderful. These guys were wonderful. One of those guys used to walk around and he would go like this. He would go, oh, what a wicked web we weave. Of course, we conspire to deceive. And so it was... I didn't think at the time that was all that funny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Looking back on it and, and having worked a lot of different places, you kind of see how people have, um, he was a government employee, so he didn't have to worry about his job. But there was a, a gallows kind of humor about it, a lot of it. And at, at a point uh, when Nixon's numbers dropped down into the 20s, it became obvious that he was going to now, did you stay, were you a, um, did you end up staying with the White, or did you end up leaving uh, shortly after August of 74 when Nixon resigned? No, I stayed, I stayed uh, into the Ford administration, um, and not for the entire time, but the period. I, actually, I got to the point where I had to, I, I literally had to go make more money, and there a lot more money to be made elsewhere. Although, because this was sort of a starter job, yeah, but you know, start. I don't know how you. You know, the put. funny thing about it is, I, I made around three bucks an hour, but that was in 1973-74. That today would be fifteen dollars an hour. So actually, I, for a kid, I was living pretty high on the hog. I mean, impossible to support a family, but for a guy like me, it was pretty good. Um, but I needed more than that in order to pay for school and. And I went in the newspaper business. Uh, but the, um, I, I stayed there during the period of time of Nixon's resignation, all the time that led up to that. And I talk about that in the book, about what went on behind the scenes with that, including the night that Nixon resigned, uh, including what happened before he gave his speech. Uh, I was there for that. Uh, a friend of mine and I, in one of the funnier stories in it. And, and my, my book is meant to be funny. It's, it, I, 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 I paint the picture of the history. I go into the history. Uh, we've been very kindly, it's been, the book's been actually rated among the top 20 best books about Watergate. Um, the, because we talk about the history, but it's also my view of some of the things that went on. Um, the, <clears throat> but, you know, I was out on the, on the lawn, on the South Lawn of the White House when Nixon, you know, made his famous, you know, double V thing. And, what everybody and knows him for. Yeah, <laughs> all that. And, and there when 
Uh, and I was in the East Room of the White House when President Ford took the oath of office. Uh, I'll tell you one of the great things about this country at that time uh, about the transfer of power. It was, the, the United States had every reason to be very proud of itself. Despite whatever you think about Nixon and what he was involved with, he resigned. He understood the Constitution. He resigned. He also realized he had no support in the Senate uh, to avoid you know, to to uh, avoid, avoid being removed from office. But he resigned. Uh, the country, for the most part, um, surrounded Ford with a lot of warmth. But one of the things that I noticed that had the greatest impact on me was that after the Nixons took off, uh, we had, there were pictures all through the West and the East Wings, big blow up pictures. And they were of, in that case, Nixon and in various things, shaking hands with crowds or coming off a helicopter or one thing. Those all came down. And within a few days, they were being replaced by pictures of President Ford. It was very smooth. There was a Friday when Nixon left. People, government employees, even including people who were political, were going back to work and going back to do the job of the U.S. government. Um, there, there, there was, there's just no argument about it. One of the wonderful things that President Ford did is he kept a lot of people on for quite some period of time uh, because he didn't think it was fair for them to end up losing their jobs, including uh, Rosemary Woods, who I'd gotten to know, and you may have read about her in history as the one who, you know, this is the 18 and a half minute gap. Uh, she's a lovely woman, but she stayed on uh, working on uh, Nixon's uh, papers. Uh, it, it was class. It was very, very classy. Yeah, and I remember a, uh, a distinct quote. I'll pull it up at the end of this after I'm done. But um, I do remember a distinct quote where he uh, sort of is remorseful and um, you know, talks about, like, he learned a lesson. Nick, Nixon's speech in the East Room uh, that day, which I snuck into, uh, I snuck into following a former Speaker of the House. Uh, it was very moving. You can see it on you know, YouTube. Actually, I think I, have a, I think I have it on my website, downstairs at thewhitehouse.com. I'll get that in. Um, it was very moving about uh, the way to look at the world and look at life. Uh, and while a lot of people sneered at it, uh, I found it very insightful. Yeah, and I will say we've actually had a pretty. Um, you mentioned earlier your book is full of humor, and it is, and it is. We've actually had a pretty deep, dark conversation yeah. leading up to that. <laughs> and I, I caught myself. I was like, oh yeah, this is actually a pretty. There's there's some forms of satire and and. Uh, history about Woodrow Wilson's desk and yep. uh, things of that nature. And I'm like, God, I've had a, a very uh, doom and gloom sort of conversation here. So I do apologize. I didn't no, <laughs> just, not we've actually I mean, had a very good discussion you know, here. I, I was a teenager, so I did the same things that anybody, uh, particularly boys, who don't have a fully formed frontal lobe <laughs> do, except I did it on a bigger stage. So I set off alarm. I mean, one day I decided... Uh, that I would meet some friends who were taking a White House tour. And I worked in the East Wing. So what I did is instead of walking through the White House, I walked outside and across the North Lawn of the White House. I set off every alarm in the place. All these Secret Service agents came running. And because you can read the story about it, I, was a, I, I had been the backup Easter Bunny, which, which and, and actually had to go into service as the... White House Easter Bunny uh, that year, uh, and people knew it, and they would harass me about it, um, including leaving carrots on my desk and stuff like that afterwards. Uh, 
after all these secret uniform secret service agents come running out, he went, oh, it's just the Easter Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was that kind of thing. Uh, a friend of mine and I, on the night that Nixon resigned, uh, we were told that non-essential personnel were to leave. Well, we just didn't consider ourselves not essential that evening. We we're going to watch history. We snuck into the press room, hung around um, down with uh, Art Buckwald. There's some names from the past that people would remember. And at one point, in, I'll, I'll, I'll ask folks to read the book to get the story. We nearly caused a major problem with the networks. Uh, all of a sudden, I had microphones in my face, and my friend did, who worked for the National Security Council, all because we thought something was funny. And I'll leave that as a matter. But, you know, in the end, uh, most of it is funny. I wrote this book. Somebody asked me, like, why did you wait so long to write this book? And I, well, I was busy. <laughs> and that's one. But I have a granddaughter. And I want my, I, these stories I that, you know, I would tell, um, I actually found that people kind of enjoyed them. And um, our book, thank goodness, has sales have reflected that. Um, the, so I, I sat and, and, and re collected my memories. Luckily, I had made notes about this stuff and some of the really crazy stuff that had happened. Um, and the last uh, thing that I'll mention on this topic in particular was uh, one day uh, I was talking, I was standing at the door to the Oval Office. It was open, I was standing with the uh, Secret Service agent who was there, president wasn't it? And all of a sudden the door in the back opens up and here comes President Ford. And the guard is trying to close the door very quickly when President Ford goes like this, and I'm looking, you know, you know, it's that thing like when a really pretty girl looks at you and you go like, it's got to be, you know, <laughs> behind me. And it was for me. And I, I left the book as a cliffhanger. Now I'm writing another book that where it kind of starts off there and talks about the other weird experiences that I had. So you left. So where did you end up from there? You said you went into the newspaper business. I went after the eventually, I worked for seven daily newspapers. Um, well, you know, it was, you had to move around to move up. And then I, end, and including working for Gannett, uh, which was the uh, parent of USA Today, and we had 100 newspapers around the country. And I, I was over the advertising in circulation, all the sales operations for those newspapers, uh, overseeing that, and it was a, it was a wonderful career. But I keep I traveled a lot, so it gave me a lot of opportunities to have weird, <laughs> strange things happen, and that's what I'm working on now. Do you um, do you miss anything about the um, jumping back to the White House? I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Uh, do you do you, or do you miss anything about working in in Washington? Uh, no, uh, actually, I ended up after leaving Washington to go into the newspaper business, I kind of made a circle around the country, came back there because that's where Gannett's headquarters were. Um, and, you know, I, I love DC in many ways. That's my home. I, I lived there more than any other place, but I don't miss it anymore. My son lives there. He's an actor. He actually makes a living at it. I'm very proud of him. And, uh, and so we get to go see, in fact, that's where we'll be headed um, after uh, this, will, I'm, I'm going to make a speech in Washington about the book, and uh, re actually I'm going to do a reading about being the White House Easter Bunny, which was just, <laughs> that's, it's, uh, it was, that was something, <laughs> I have to tell you, so. Right, because Easter is right around the corner, so it actually is kind of fitting. Yes, right. <laughs> okay, um, so or tell me about... Um, so you mentioned earlier, tell me a little bit further about 9-11. Um, you, did you say that you had just came out of there? Well, my office was in Roslyn, Virginia, which is right across the Potomac from the district. And uh, I was on the 26th floor. My window looked out over um, the Iwo Jima Memorial 
Arlington National Cemetery, and you can see a piece of the Pentagon. It'd be two or three miles from the Pentagon, something like that, as the crow flies, more or less, something. And uh, it, it was just, it was close enough. And I'm sitting there that morning, uh, and the earth literally shook when the plane hit the Pentagon. Uh, one of my uh, staff members, was coming in late that morning. This, in fact, this story will be in my next book. Uh, and she, uh, the, the plane actually went about 150 feet, we figured, in front of her uh, as it came down. She was she was coming in late. She was out on the expressway. And as it came down, just right in front of her, it was just horrific. Uh, I had, uh, it, and then there's some other interesting things that happened that on, on what was an absolutely horrific day. W one of the oddities is I, I, the cell system went down. I mean, you know, this was 22, you know, 21 years ago, and the technology wasn't the same. The, the, the whole cell system went down. I couldn't reach uh, anybody by telephone to tell them I was okay. Uh, my parents, as a matter of fact, thought that I might have been, uh, I would certainly, that I would, may have been hurt or, or dead because there were original reports that said, because of the angle that people looked at it, that uh, smoke was coming out of the Gannett building uh, and that the plane may have hit that, but luckily not. Um, the, the only person I could reach was my daughter, who was at Marquette University through something that was called a Palm Pilot that to you would be, you know, Smithsonian kind of level stuff that you go look at at a museum. But it was connected to AOL and she had just come to sit down in her room uh, to do something and I was able to send her an email that said that I was okay and that she was able to contact the rest of the family. But I, it, when we evacuated the building, we walked up towards the Iwo Jima Memorial, which was supposed to be a rallying point. Uh, as we went up there, a police officer stopped us and said, where do you think you're going? And we explained, and he said, don't do that. He said, there's a plane over Pennsylvania at this point that's headed this way, and if they're looking to knock down towers, uh, they'll hit yours, and, and you know, you, you could end up dead. So we really had nowhere to go. It was all absolute pandemonium, as one might expect. And that's just, uh, I mean, what how, just unimaginable. Yeah, um, it was. So going back to the, um, going back to your, your, your book. So how this came, I know you said you had, um, you had notes over the years of, uh, you know, stuff that you did or people that you ran into or, um, just things of that nature. How long, uh, where, where did you get the idea for the book? Well, it, it was to try to memorialize some of these stories, um, hopefully for, you know, grandchildren one day. My kids had heard this stuff a million times. They were sick of it. So I thought I would memorialize it for. Uh, right. Um, it's also a bestseller in political humor, and it has been since. <laughs> I was going to say, and you're dealing, I mean, of course, with some, um, uh, maybe some sensitive issues, I don't know, but uh, did you have to fact check the, or did you have to check the, with, um, you know, anybody uh, at that federal level to make sure that this was all good to go, that you weren't giving in a way anything? Right. Well, I didn't know anything. <laughs> um, the only thing I did that ever came close to that. Um, was to deliver a CIA briefing uh, every day. But I wasn't about to open any of that stuff. Uh, you know what would ring in my head when I was that age? Of my father going, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> don't, don't, don't open that. You go to jail. <laughs> so I never opened that stuff. There was no need to do anything like that. Um, the What I did is I went back to... Uh, old newspapers. I wanted to verify my memories of when and where things happened so that they would be as accurate as I could make them. 
I do have a disclaimer that, you know, a lot of those memories were at that time, you know, at least 40 years old. And, eh, you know, sometimes it, it may not be, it, the event occurred, it may just not be exactly uh, as I described it because I, I'm relying on some memories. But the facts are correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you said you're working on, a, on another book now? What, do you, what are you working on right now? Well, this is a collection story. Um, the of uh, short stories uh, about other events, the other weird things that have happened. Uh, I one of the stories I have is actually I have a ghost, a real, honest to goodness ghost story from uh, a, a time in, in, in a hotel um, that scared the dickens out of me. Um, and there's reason to believe there. There was a person who was murdered. It may have been in that room. I don't know, but I saw some things that I don't want to see again. Um, I once was trying to, I, on one day, you know, have you ever had those days when something starts going wrong and then it just keeps getting worse? Um, I have a lot of them. You have a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, where we were taking off from a small airport, uh, I was traveling to to Philadelphia from um, Allentown, Pennsylvania. And it was a small commuter plane to Philadelphia and then one to Hartford after that. And it's a hot day, it's miserable, everything else. And we're not going anywhere. And finally a guy goes out to say, I'm gonna go check on what's going on. He was an engineer. He goes, you're not gonna believe this. The pilot is on top of the wing <laughs> with a ruler. I I mean, there's like 30 guys on this, and we're all, you know, everybody a business guy, right? He was checking the fuel. The fuel gauge wasn't working. He was checking. And, you know, you stop and think about it, you go, well, maybe that's better. <laughs> so we did, and then I got onto a plane where one guy kept screaming we were going to crash, and another guy who was the pilot who sounded just like Elmer Fudd. It was it, it, bizarre. So I, I have, a, I have a, a number of those that are... Um, and, and particularly involved travel. Uh, I'd spent time in Russia uh, working with newspapers there after the wall had come down. It was uh, a voluntary, completely voluntary. I, I was uh, recruited by a group who were trying to help them learn how to be independent after the wall had come down uh, and after the end of the Soviet Union. And I had, you, you want to talk about experiences, I slept in a the same asylum one night with my colleagues um, out of desperation. It was a, it was an insane asylum guarded by sheep herders um, with little crooks and little hats. And it was absolutely bizarre. We were kidnapped in a polite way to a town at one point. This was in the Urals, uh, Ural Mountains, um, because they had never met Americans before and they weren't going to let us go until, I mean, it was like five of us. They weren't going to let us go. And, um, so we had any number of any number of different adventures. So it's a lot of fun um, to to write those. I, I want that for my granddaughter as well, so she can write. She'll go at some point, like most kids, she'll read it and roll her eyes, and then maybe when she's older, she'll go, "Wow, you know, he was willing at, to do at least to stick his neck out and see what happens." So I was crazy. I wish we could keep talking like this. It's <laughs> fascinating, but unfortunately, um, I know you probably have to get on the road at some yep. point today, and to um, you know we we could regale our uh, our viewers, but we're gonna we're gonna have to cut it off here. Unfortunately, okay. I appreciate your time.